Okay, so the definition of uniformly continuous is kind of unwieldy and hard to work with. And for that reason, it's often really challenging to prove that a function is uniformly continuous when it is. I mean, in this chapter, we're sort of seeing some guarantees, some various things about a function that once those things are true, then they will suffice to show that that function is uniformly continuous. That can help us to avoid working with the triply quantified definition, which is kind of nasty. But I didn't want to move on before we did at least one example where we actually use that definition explicitly. In this video, we're going to use the definition of uniform continuity directly to show that the reciprocal function f of x equals 1 over x is not uniformly continuous on the open interval from 0 to 1. Let's get down to the weeds. So remember, the definition of uniformly continuous is something that is triply quantified. A function is uniformly continuous on a domain E if, for all epsilon greater than 0, there's the first quantifier, there exists a delta greater than 0, second quantifier, such that for all points x and x naught in the domain, that's the third quantifier, and then there's a conditional. If x and x naught are delta close to one another, then their images are epsilon close to one another. So there's a lot going on in this definition. That's why I think working through an example like the one we're about to do carefully and slowly is really the best way to understand how we could use a definition like this one. So let's try to use this definition directly to show that the reciprocal function f of x equals 1 over x is not uniformly continuous on the open interval from 0 to 1. So I had sort of used this little visual to, to justify, uh, at least give us a, a plausible argument for why this function is not uniformly continuous on the open interval from 0 to 1. Because if we pick an epsilon, you know, whatever, we'd, uh, whatever the universe decides to pick for epsilon, let's say we pick epsilon equals 1 half or something like that, then there is some place on the open interval from 0 to 1, whatever delta that I pick, so it doesn't really matter where I put this delta, whatever delta that I pick, there's some place on the open interval from 0 to 1 where there are x values that are that close, that are delta close to one another, whose images are not within epsilon of one another, where that epsilon was the one that we picked up from. And so this graph is kind of showing me that, yeah, this seems plausible, right? In places where the slope of this graph is not very steep, it looks like it's pretty easy to get the images of delta close points to be epsilon close. But once we start getting close enough to this vertical asymptote for f of x equals 1 over x, that's when things start to go haywire. My graph starts to get really, really steep, and it begins to get really, really hard to get points that are delta close to have images that are epsilon close. And so let's fill in the details that can actually show us that this, this plausibility argument actually carries some water. So the first thing to do if we suspect that this function is not uniformly continuous is we have to turn the definition of uniform continuity inside out. Right? And since this definition has three quantifiers followed by an if-then conditional statement, we have to have all of our logical wits about us to turn this definition around. If I want to show that this function is not uniformly continuous, then instead of a for all epsilon greater than zero, I'm going to lead out with a there exists epsilon greater than zero. Such that instead of there exists delta, now we have to say for all delta. Instead of for all points x and x naught in my domain, we now have to say there exist points x and x naught in my domain. So we've turned all the universal quantifiers into existential quantifiers and vice versa. So that takes care of the, the three quantifiers that come first in this definition. And then we need to turn inside out the conditional, the if-then statement that forms the predicate of my definition. In the original definition, the predicate is if x and x naught are delta close, then their images are epsilon close. And so when I turn that inside out, remember, turning an if-then statement on its head the only way to disprove an if-then statement is to find a situation in which the hypothesis holds, but the conclusion fails. And so we can show that a function is not uniformly continuous if there exists an epsilon greater than zero, such that for all delta greater than zero, there exist points x and x naught in the domain, such that even though x and x naught are delta close, their images are not epsilon close. They are epsilon separated. The absolute value of the difference between f of x and f of x naught is greater than or equal to epsilon. So this probably is one of the most challenging parts of writing a disproof of something like uniform continuity, is just getting that definition adequately negated so that we know what the burden of proof that we have for ourselves is going to be. 
Right, so this is the, the definition of a function not being uniform and continuous that we're going to try to use. So if I structure out a proof, um, I should figure out that the first thing that shows up in my quantifiers is there exists epsilon greater than zero. So what this means is that I should be able, I have the freedom as the author of this proof to pick a convenient epsilon. Right? And if there's an epsilon that works for my argument that's specific, then I should use it. Um, I'm gonna choose epsilon equals one half. It's the picture that I have uh, underneath me over here, right? Because it looks like at least for epsilon equals one half that there is gonna be some way, no matter how I've picked my delta, to pick my x and my x naught such that we don't have the delta close points having epsilon close images. So I'm just gonna pick epsilon equals one half. This choice, it turns out, is going to give me a convenient way of picking my delta, or not picking my delta, but picking my points, x and x naught, in just a moment. Um, but we could just as easily turn this argument around and modify it in slight ways to so that whatever epsilon that you picked, you could do it with one, you could do it with 0.1, whatever. Uh, there are ways of modifying this argument. So I'm picking one half just sort of because for right now, just to kind of give me a place to start. Then the universe comes in and picks a delta. So this is the problem with the negation proof, right, is that we don't have any control as authors about the delta that gets picked. And so on my picture down here, I'm gonna kind of imagine, I'm not even gonna put in like a specific value for delta. I'm just gonna imagine that delta has been chosen for us by the universe. So then after that delta gets selected for us by the universe, now we once again are empowered to find these points, x and x naught. We can find them, we can declare them, we can bring them into existence however we wish, even very specifically. But the requirement is that those x and x naught need to be delta close to one another for the delta that the universe has selected for us, but their images need to be epsilon separated from one another. So how in the world are we gonna do this? Well, this is a place where if you just read a proof of this thing in a textbook, it's gonna make no sense. Um, because a finished, polished, written proof has not given you any insight into how the author of that proof has discovered the result in the first place. So this is where I pull out my famous cocktail napkin. And on this cocktail napkin, I try to do the scratch work that would be necessary to kind of substantiate, well, how am I going to make the images, 1 over x and 1 over x naught, be separated by at least epsilon, in this case, 1 half. So on my napkin, I'll kind of write out that inequality and then try to move it around, try to play it around, you know, try, try to do stuff to it that can help me to discover how I can pick an X and an X naught. So that's what I get to, that's the freedom I get to have now is to pick my X and my X naught however I want to. So the first thing I might do is let's pick the X to be less than X naught so that we can forget about the absolute values so that the reciprocal of one over X is uh, greater than one over X naught. Okay, but then if I do that, I, can, I might ask myself, well, what kinds of numbers do I know that are guaranteed to be separated by at least a distance of one half? And as I was thinking about how to write this proof, the insight that came to me, right, is, well, I do know of an entire collection, an infinite collection of numbers that are all separated by at least one half from one another. Those are the integers. So if I can choose x and x naught so that their reciprocals are distinct integers, then I will get this inequality to be satisfied for free. I won't even have to work hard at all for it. If I can make these distinct integers, then they will for sure be separated by at least one half because distinct integers are separated by at least one. So let me pick one over x and one over x naught to be distinct integers. Actually, in a minute, I'm probably gonna pick them to just be consecutive integers so that I know that they're distinct by guarantee. Okay, so if I pick them to be distinct integers, then I'm going to get this separation between 1 over x and 1 over x naught just automatically. And so now my challenge is I need to know why it is that I can pick these integers in such a way that x and x naught are delta close to one another because I don't have any control over that delta. Right? So I have to know based on the delta that the universe has selected for me, maybe I don't have to work very hard to pick my x and my x naught. But if my delta is chosen by the universe to be really, really, really small, then I might need to pick my x and my x naught to be really close to that vertical asymptote in order to get that epsilon separation between their images. So we might have to do a little bit more work here. 
right? How do I know for sure that I can pick integers, n and m, such that the reciprocals, 1 over n and 1 over m, are within delta of one another? There are non-constructive ways in which I could do this. For example, I could go back to first semester analysis and say, well, the sequence of reciprocals, 1 over n, is a convergent sequence. It converges to 0. And therefore, since it's a convergent sequence, it's a Cauchy sequence. And therefore, as a Cauchy sequence, there exists a capital N such that for all of the little n's past that capital N uh, and all the little m's past that capital N, the difference between 1 over n and 1 over m is less than this delta, which is supplied to me. So I could do a non-constructive thing and say, there exists an n and an m such that this thing is satisfied because the sequence of 1 over n's is a Cauchy sequence. You know, because we know it's a convergent sequence, therefore it's Cauchy. But I kind of like to do things constructive wherever I can. And so, again, let's just do the sort of the naive thing. And we can make distinct integers just by picking m to be 1 more than n. Right? So if I pick m to be n plus 1, then I can rearrange the absolute value of the difference, 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. That's 1 over n squared plus n. So how do I make that less than delta? Well, I can do that by taking the reciprocal on both sides and observing that I can do that by making n squared plus n greater than the reciprocal of delta which I can guarantee to do by choosing n to itself have been greater than 1 over delta. If the integer n that I choose, the positive integer n that I choose, is greater than 1 over delta, then n squared plus n will be greater still right, than 1 over delta. So n squared plus n is greater than 1 over delta. Therefore, the reciprocal is less than delta. Therefore, x minus x naught is going to have been less than delta. So all of this cocktail napkin work and all of that creativity and everything that just went into that argument all happens behind the scenes in our finished polished proof. So that when we go back to the proof, it ends up looking something like this. We want to find an x and an x naught that are delta close, but whose images are separated by at least one half. How do I do that? I'm going to choose n to be an integer that's greater than 1 over delta. I might, for example, say, let's let n be the next greatest integer that's larger than 1 over delta using this little ceiling function, if you like. So once I choose that integer, I'm then going to let n, uh, sorry, let x be 1 over n, and let x naught be 1 over n plus 1. Right, so there's where I've picked these two integers to be consecutive to one another. Then we can show that x and x naught are delta close. How? Just by repeating this argument that's at the bottom right-hand corner of the cocktail napkin. Right? The absolute value of x minus x naught is the absolute value of the difference of the reciprocals of n and n plus 1, which is equal to the reciprocal of n squared plus n. And since n squared is positive, the reciprocal of n squared plus n is less than the reciprocal of n. And since by assumption n is greater than 1 over delta, that's this selection up here, that means that the reciprocal of n is less than the reciprocal of 1 over delta. And that means that this, is, this whole quantity here is less than delta, reading from left to right. So this is why x and x naught are delta close to one another. That's the scratch work that was done in the, the bottom half of my cocktail napkin. But then we can also use the top half of my cocktail napkin to guarantee why the images, f of x0 and f of x, are epsilon separated. Because the images, 1 over x and 1 over x0, are the integers n and n plus 1. And the integers n and n plus 1 are separated by a distance of 1, which I think we can agree is greater than or equal to 1 half, which was the epsilon that we selected. Therefore, the images of these points, f of x and f of x0, are separated by at least epsilon. And that completes the proof that this function was not uniformly continuous on the open interval from 0 to 1. So you can see here how the, probably the thing that confuses the most when we're trying to work directly with the definition of something like uniform continuity is just coming to grips as the discoverers and the authors of a proof with what we get to choose, what we get to bring into existence, and what the universe is selecting for us. If we're trying to prove that a function is uniformly continuous, the universe gets to make two choices, and we as the authors only get to make one. The universe picks an epsilon, and then we respond by picking a delta, but then the universe goes and picks two arbitrary x and x naught. And so we get, a little, we get a little bit less freedom to choose if we're trying to show that something is uniformly continuous. But when we were proving, as we just did, that a function is not uniformly continuous, we get to make two choices. We get to pick an epsilon, and we get to pick the points x and x naught. But the degree of difficulty there is that in between those choices, the universe gets to pick an arbitrary delta. 
And so when we pick our epsilon, we can pick that epsilon without sort of reference to anything else. But then the universe selects delta, and we can pick x and x naught in response to that delta if we want to when we're showing that something is not uniformly continuous. And in this example, when we showed that the reciprocal function was not uniformly continuous on the open interval from 0 to 1, we started out with this seemingly unmotivated choice of epsilon equals 1 half. But then I was able on this cocktail napkin to use that choice of 1 half to sort of lead me to the idea that we can make, we can select an x and an x naught because that's something we get to do. We can select them so that their reciprocals are 1 half separated by selecting them so that their reciprocals are integers. Right, because we know integers are at least one half separated. So that was how, in this argument, we used the, the, the freedom and the liberty that we had as the authors of the proof to make those two selections. And then at that point, it didn't matter what the delta was, although we had to choose the epsilon, sorry, we had to choose the n, we had to choose our x value with reference to an integer n which was greater than one over delta. So we did use delta in our uh, definition, in our choice of x and x naught. But our choice of epsilon that came up front didn't make reference to anything else. So this is a good example of a, a proof, an argument that is well worth sort of going back and looking at sort of repeatedly, <laughs> if you like, just to kind of, again, wrap your head around how we used the information uh, that was available to us, how we used the agency that we have as authors of the proof that is only the agency that is given to us by the quantifiers in the definition that we are trying to satisfy in our proof. But we used those to the hilt. We selected an epsilon. Then the universe arbitrarily selected a delta. And then we picked an x and an x naught with reference to that delta so that x and x naught were that close, they were delta close to one another, but their images were epsilon separated for the epsilon that we chose in the beginning. So I hope this was a helpful example to help come to grips with how these kinds of things worked. <laughs>